He's been warming, warming up in the sheds all evening and finally Wally the Mechanical Maroon has got a target. He's lining up the punt now. Who's he going to send away? We think it could be Steve Dixon. Is that Steve Dixon? There he goes. Bye bye Dicko. You're gone. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And with the Queensland election coming right down to the last kick, Nine's graphics undoubtedly won the night, with losing candidates like One Nation leader Steve Dixon getting punted by Wally the Mechanical Marone in true Queensland style. Can you come back, please? Because we've got somebody else that has to go from the LNP. Sorry, Tanya Smith. Uh, she hasn't won Mount Omni, and that's another MP into touch. Wally joins a distinguished team of electoral eliminators that Nine has created over the years, like The Shredder back in 2007, The Shark Pool in 2013, The Boot in 2015, The Gurgler in 2012, and last year's unforgettable The Crusher. Who have we got first? So, here comes The Crusher. Yeah. And who, who is first? That was Nick Vardis. Things were a little more sedate on the ABC, which was not exactly wowing viewers with segments like this. Is the graphic going to go on? We've lost the graphics. Well, what's happening in Thur Thurungawa is that I can, I can do it on the touch screen. That's what I can do. Um, with your mouse, I think. With my mouse, because the touch screen doesn't touch on your mouse screen. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, except for some reason it can't load the data, so I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> <laughs> and Barry Cassidy, our very own Barry Cassidy, his tweet is uh, going viral. Labor will get three or four more seats than they need for a majority. Terrible result for the LNP tonight. That tweet, which was already nearly two hours old when it was broadcast, did not age well, as we now know. And over on Sky, they were also calling victory for Labour a little too early. As you can see from this morning's front page in Brisbane's Courier Mail. Premier's reign delay. Needing 47 seats for a majority, Labour is still four short with 12 results to come. But the big news is the failure of One Nation, despite all that media hype, which has not yet won a seat from 61 candidates. Although last night Pauline Hanson was still talking up the result. We've done extremely well. Pauline, if you don't win any seats, you will have failed. <laughs> but you that, will have. I mean, that's no, a fact. No, it's not a fact. If that, you don't win any seats, not, you'll have failed. Not at all. Not at all. And uh, definitely not a failure. But now to a very different sort of media story, and one which echoes what's been happening in the United States over the last few weeks on a far bigger scale. Australian television star Don Burke, the host of long-running and successful program Burke's Backyard, has been accused this morning of indecent assault and sexual harassment. He decided that it was OK for him to put his hands on my T-shirt and try and pull my bra strap, my bra off, and try to somehow remove my clothing. Don Burke's behaviour was an open secret in the TV industry for years. But a joint investigation by the ABC and Fairfax has uncovered multiple allegations of sexual harassment and indecent assault in the 1980s and 1990s. And with these come suggestions that complaints were ignored by Channel 9 because Burke was a star. Every single person in management has known about Don Burke. Every male manager. There is not one that does not know, said a former Nine staffer. Tonight, Don Burke went on Channel 9 to deny the allegations. So might you be guilty of all of these things? No, absolutely not. No, 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 no. But these sort of things bear no relationship to who I am and what I'm about. And there are plenty of people from that time at Burke's backyard that were there that have come to me and said, how can they say this? They're furious. These things didn't happen. Don Burke also rejects any comparison to Harvey Weinstein, the notorious Hollywood film producer whose more serious abuse was exposed last month by The New York Times and The New Yorker. Weinstein's dramatic demise brought a day of reckoning in the United States, giving women in the industry the courage to speak out. And that is now cutting short the careers of some of America's best-known journalists. Once legendary and now disgraced journalist Charlie Rose out of a job this morning, fired by CBS News. The New York Times is suspending one of its White House correspondents, reporter Glenn Thrush. Political contributor Mark Halperin will no longer be appearing on the network after at least five women have come forward alleging sexual harassment. On our count, 42 men in U.S. public life have now been accused, with politicians like Roy Moore, 
former President George H. W. Bush, Senator Al Franken and Congressman John Conyers joining the media ranks. So, could the Don Burke case in Australia be just the start of something similar here? We've had hundreds and hundreds of women contact us. It's a veritable tsunami of cases of sexual assault, intimidation and abuse in the Australian workforce, particularly the Australian media. Tracy Spicer, who detailed her own experiences of sexual harassment in TV after she was sacked from Channel 10 in 2006, is a driving force behind Women in Media, which, since Weinstein's fall, has received complaints of sexual harassment, bullying or physical assault from 500 women involving 65 different men, many of whom are still working in the media. One of them in particular has been offending for about 40 years, to the point where even three years ago, a young woman who I worked with, he kept grabbing at her underpants in the workplace every weekend. She went to the boss and complained about it, and he said, just wear jeans so he can't get his hand up there. So this is a person that's currently working in Australian media? That's exactly right. One serial offender, now dead, was John Sorrell, Channel 9's news chief in Melbourne for 25 years until 2003. Ex-9 reporter Alison Mao recently described him as... A monster to the young women in his newsroom. This man was a legend in the game. But the number of scoops broadcast or careers launched will never outweigh the damage done. Commercial TV and 9 in particular have long been notorious for their blokey culture. Thanks in part to a 2008 unfair dismissal action brought against 9 by reporter Christine Spiteri whose statement of claim made this memorable allegation about Nine's then Head of News and Current Affairs, John Westacott. To make it in this industry, you've got to have fuckability. To make it in this game, women have to be fuckable. Westacott is alleged to have said. There is also the famous case of Jessica Rowe, whom Eddie Maguire wanted to sack from Nine's Today Show back in 2006. As Nine's Mark Llewellyn alleged in yet another court case, Maguire asked him and fellow executives... What are we going to do about Jessica? When should we bone her? More recently, in 2016, Channel 7 cadet journalist Amy Torba complained about sexual harassment by a colleague in Seven's Adelaide newsroom and was promptly dismissed. Which, says Tracy Spicer, accords with women in media's experience of how cases have traditionally been dealt with. The key finding is that media workplaces have protected perpetrators while sacking, sidelining or silencing victims. So, has the culture now changed? Channel 9 boss Hugh Marks assured the Herald two weeks ago that it has. I'm sure there were problems 20 years ago. I'm sure there are things that will come out in the public that will talk to those problems. But from where I sit right now, I feel like we've got an excellent culture that supports equality. Well, maybe so. But a quick look across the industry shows men still run the show. In TV, every network still has a male news boss. And in commercial TV, we could find only one woman running around a dozen big city newsrooms. In the print media, it's a similar picture. None of News Corp's seven metropolitan titles currently has a female editor. And out of four regional dailies, women only edit two, the Townsville Bulletin and Cairns Post. Men also run Seven West Media's two mastheads in Perth. Over at Fairfax, Lisa Davies edits the Sydney Morning Herald, but the editor of the Australian Financial Review is male, and so is the editor of The Age, although we should point out that the last editor, Mark Forbes, lost his job after allegations of sexual harassment were made against him. That apart, almost wherever you look, the blokes still rule, which brings us back to whether the Donberg case will be just one of many. One big difference between here and the United States is that our defamation laws are much tougher and they will almost certainly provide more protection for perpetrators. In Australia, the target of a story doesn't have to prove that an accusation is false. But the person making or publishing an accusation needs to prove it is true. So the defendants have to do all the heavy lifting. We'll see how it goes. But we reckon there's a few men in the industry, and we understand the ABC and Fairfax have four more in their sights, who would now be feeling pretty nervous. But now, let's go to more bad behaviour in the Australian media. This time in full public view, shattering the serenity of Sunday mornings on Melbourne's 3AW. They're all nut jobs, Nick. They, Have a look at them. Ah, all young kids all going, oh, yeah. Well, but, they, but they're raving despite, mad. It's worse than drooling at the mouth. They're so mad. They, well, they're mad. You're mad, you idiots. You're mad. Yep, that's veteran broadcaster John Michael Housen doing what he does best. So, who was the 80-year-old calling mad? 
Well, in the wake of the Greens winning Melbourne's Northcote by-election and fired up by this Sunday Herald Sun front page about rising power prices, John Michael unleashed. But all these anti-coal nut jobs, you should go... Why don't you go out the barn and hang yourself? The, uh, hang, on, hang on, hang on. Useless. But John the Michael... Useless. And that was just the start, as co-host Nick McCallum tried, but failed, to take him to task. Yeah, telling people to go out and hang themselves I is not a good thing well, to do. Useless. They may as well, you know, they're not doing any good at all. But, and I will say what I like, Nick. But go, I, you take overdose, do will you? Jump in front of a tram hey, because you're John, bloody useless. I, I, I think that's going too far. Oh, but of what, course it's going. I'll go a bit further. Why don't you take a, get some rat poison oh, and take rat uh, poison? Uh, uh, oh, yeah. let, let's calm that down a bit. And finally, he did. An hour and a half later, after management intervened, John Michael apologised with a sorry, not sorry. I should have said, go and jump at the lake or whatever I did before, jump in front of a tram or take rat boys. Well, I mean, of... I shouldn't have done that. No. I'm sorry, but, yeah. you know, when you, when you get mad, you get mad. Two days later, 3AW's top-rating broadcaster Neil Mitchell decided that wasn't enough and took aim at his colleagues, saying Housen's comments were stupid, offensive, callous and were demeaning the station. Mitchell then got psychologist Michael Carr Gregg to state the bleeding obvious. You cannot go on air and induce people to hang themselves, take an overdose, jump in front of a tram uh, or consume rat poison. And you can be as mad as you like about issues, but that's not responsible broadcasting. It sure isn't, and the commercial radio code of practice is pretty clear. Under the headline, Material Not Suitable for Broadcast, it says a station must not broadcast a program that... ...depicts suicide favourably, or presents suicide as a means of achieving a desired result. We asked 3AW what action it was taking, and if it agreed Housen and the station were in breach of the code. It told us... No, suicide was not depicted favourably or as a means to an end in the segment. But it did at least condemn Housen's remarks, telling MediaWatch... The station considers this on-air behaviour to be completely unacceptable and contrary to its own editorial standards. So, did it sack him? No, it did not. Did it even take him off air for this week's programme? No, again. And it's not as though this is his first offence. Earlier this year, Housen called Jermaine Greer a slut on air. He once said Apex gang members should go back to Bongo Land. And in 2012, 3AW suspended him for a month after a Nazi-inspired rant against Julian Assange's mother. No doubt some of Housen's listeners love him for it, but we reckon he's an embarrassment to 3AW and it's a disgrace that they still let him on air. And finally, to a gotcha moment that backfired. So, the aim of the game is to ask politicians how much their government owes. And this example from January with Lisa Harvey, then acting Premier of WA, is how it is supposed to work. Just out of interest, what, what's the debt figure for 16-17? Oh, I'd, I'd have to go and brush up on, on those sorts of figures, Josh. I'd, deficit? The, I, I haven't caught up with where that we're up to on that at this point in time. Gotcha! Fast forward to the Today Show last week and Carl Stefanovic with a twinkle in his eye. The PM joins us now. Good morning, PM. Good morning, good morning. And soon Carl was lining him up with the curly question. How can you promise tax cuts for middle income battlers yeah. when the debt of this country is spiralling out of control? Let's just have a look at the debt right now. And just incidentally, mm. that's the national debt right where you are, PM. Uh, that's just at the bottom of the screen, mm. you can't see it. Yeah. Any idea what that number is? No. Gotcha again! But not so fast, because while the PM may not know his ACDC hits, he used to be a banker, and debt figures are right up his alley. Well, Carl, I can't read the, I can't read what the is screen, the national but I debt? know what the net debt yeah. is. But What well, is it? Well, the net debt is around $360 billion. Yeah. Right, that's that, the net debt. OK. Whoops! Yes, that's $360 billion and not $6,500 billion, which is 18 times as much. And which, according to the Australian debt clock, is what's owed by everyone in Australia put together. And next day, having checked his calculator, Carl was back for what he called a clarification. We are very sorry for the confusion. I take full responsibility for confusing you and myself. I'm still confused. The only big numbers I will feature on the show from here on will be the cash giveaway to help you pay down your debt. Now, there's nothing confusing about that, is there? 
And that is all from us. You can read more about tonight's stories on our Facebook page or our website. You can also catch the show on iView and contact me or MediaWatch on Twitter. But for now, until next week, that's it. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.